Okay, so there was a number of questions that we didn't get time to cover during the webinar itself. Um, but we're going to record uh, answers from, from our panelists now. Um, most of the questions kind of can be summarized in, in, in one theme. And that is that the change that we've experienced post COVID has been this movement to a more of a hybrid set of solutions uh, around logistics, around the way freight is, is managed, deliveries happen, our retailers operate, all of those aspects of the the flows within an urban uh, landscape. So the points that we've been asked are specific things like the e-bikes and the truck upgrade program in, in New York, but also just generally how this hybrid model kind of works and what we're seeing in our urban environments. So I'd like to just ask the panelists one by one to just give their, their, their view on this. And I'll start off with you, Denise, because there were some specific ones about what you're seeing in New York. So maybe you and Rosanna can touch on those and then pass on and we'll, we'll get that view from uh, Bruce and Margaret. Great, thanks Andrew. Um, I think what's one of the most important aspects to, to really take away from our, our conversation today um, is that the urban freight solutions are not a one size fits all, right? You really have to be thinking about context sensitive approaches um, and what works well in one particular area or district may not work well somewhere else. So it's really fine tuning and finding kind of the local flavor um, for these solutions. Um, my, my biggest, I think, takeaway, because the freight industry and the supply chain moves so quickly and changes so quickly, is that we really need to have strong relationships with the public and pri private sector, um, really to inform and integrate them in, well at the beginning of our planning process. If we're trying to plan something for them, you know, we put it out, they may be already on to the next thing um, and innovating, right? So they're con constantly looking for ways to drive efficiency and squeeze efficiency out of the system. Um, but in many instances, we're not in, in, uh, at pace. Um, so really just making sure that we are working very closely um, with the public, the private sector as well. Um, and ensuring that we find more context sensitive solutions um, within specific elements, right? So off our deliveries, as I mentioned, um, it's a great program where it makes sense and the vertically integrated chains can absorb this within their operations. They can make that shift. They can accommodate unattended off our deliveries um, because there's a staffing issue associated with that, right? So it may not work well for some partners. So these are just some examples of explaining that we have a whole suite of solutions that have to be tailored. I'm gonna hand it over to Rosanna um, to just add some additional insights as well. Yeah, I think for me, the question about kind of what the hybrid model means, um, you know, we know there's a significant impact in suburban and less dense areas when it comes to malls, you know, especially um, strip malls and, and we're seeing what Amazon is doing, right? And taking them into distribution centers. Um, one of the things I learned from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, they run a center for, I think, urban excellence for freight, um, a VREF center. Um, through a study that they've done over COVID, they've actually seen initially that while we're inducing vehicle trips because of the pandemic, that we're actually not substituting person trips. So we're actually send, you know, so you might have ordered something from Target because it wasn't available at your local place, but then you've also gone and picked up exactly what you needed that day anyways. And so we're kind of just adding more into the streets. And so, you know, kind of bearing that in mind, I think there's a way to think about an urban main street with the, this activity. Um, you know, I think if there's simply going to be more deliveries and we need to kind of accommodate these alternative delivery modes and start to take into our building infrastructure and also the public realm infrastructure for loading and pickups. I showed you a picture of what it looks like um, when there's not enough space and packages are staged all over the sidewalk. Um, I think, you know, if you want to be clever in urban planning, you start to integrate that in a way that is exciting and welcoming and activating space instead of competing with it, um, you know, in other uses. And so I think, you know, where we install lockers, um, where we put micro hubs um, for deliveries, where the cargo bikes can leave from and, and, you know, and 
access where they need to go. Those all need to be accommodated somehow. And so I think when we think about a new urban paradigm, these are the things that really need to be incorporated and not just an afterthought that gets layered into the system as part of the mobility network, but actually housed within the building networks, you know, the, or sorry, the buildings and, and the blocks themselves. Um, and I think then we see other exciting things that complement e-commerce, whether it's, um, I think we've seen mobile groceries. Again, so, you know, if those are bringing, you know, groceries to areas, you know, that might not have as much access, um, you know, again, where are we hosting it in the public realm and how can it complement what's the urban fabric that already exists? and again, be complementary to multiple modes um, and needs within that space. So I think, you know, as planners, this is the kinds of things that we need to think about, um, you know, and, and really start to kind of innovate and, and be clever in implementing. Yes, th thank you. Thank you, Rosanne. No, very valid, valid, very valid point. And, and I think one of the things that we wanted to do today was to show there is big differences between a, a, an old traditional constrained city like New York and a, a newer, uh, more spaced um, city such as Houston. And I think um, one of the, despite those differences, there's a lot of commonality. And I think in terms of use of existing space assets, call them as you are, is going to be vital because this change is could, could create significant issues for us, whether that's uh, congestion, whether it's just building unnecessary cost. So um, Bruce, you spoke a lot about um, the planning um, dimension for this and what is actually happening in that dynamic change. So, so based on that, what, what, what's your thoughts? Well, you know, you, may, you just made a really important point about the public realm. So in New York City, they, they spend about $304 million a square mile in their city budget. Uh, we spend seven million in Houston. Okay, so the public, our our public realm is famously informal, right? And so we are a loose fit city, and so and so how we use the public realm is is different. Uh, now, having having said that, you know, in a big metro like ours, we're still a tech industry, we have the largest med center in the United States. Uh, and, a, and we're a growing diversity in the economy. So I'm part of this, when you look at, but we also have a big focus on equity as a community, because we really have that, that sort of bipolar economy here in Houston. So, and so in this space between pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, one of the most important things to do is that virtual economy that's, that's supporting that hybrid, that virtual infrastructure, whether there's computer access or internet access training, you know, that's a huge equity question. And so if we're all gonna move forward together into the next phase and not strip off, uh, one, put one, once again, another barrier to part, part of our community that still needs access uh, to the next economy, we have to invest in that as a, as a strategic investment. And the companies that do that and are aware of that are also going to come out ahead. That's a huge part of our economy that is going to need to be serviced. Fine. Uh, okay. And Margaret, I, any closing uh, thoughts from, from you uh, on this point? Well, I, I'd like to tag on to, you know, what Bruce just said. I, I mean, I think there's going to be winners that the organizations that can um, have an agile delivery system and it even, you know, connecting to something Rosanna said, delivering groceries into possibly food deserts, just like we had the ice cream mobile or the milkman when we were all young children, right? Um, that that may be the model that how you you flexibly serve um, during a pandemic. I think another um, thing that's a little bit different between Houston and New York, obviously, is um, the density. But Houston, over the last ten years, has been expanding infill development, and we will be at this point in twenty or thirty years where we really need to consider how we do that last mile and you know do we have certain hours preferential hours for restocking a store or or an office building with goods 
Um, right now, I mean, it, there is, we're sprawled out. So, I mean, we don't have some of the same constraints, but where I see a lot of commonality is how we're addressing um, the streets, the parking lots, um, for expanding restaurant and bar space. Yeah, okay. And, you know, and this is a topic we can speak about probably for another hour. Um, thank you all again um, for, for your presentations and answering those points today. Um, I will close off the recording now and um, look forward to seeing you all again at the future SILT and ARUP uh, webinar.